Hello, good evening, and welcome to today's session at the Bangalore International Center in collaboration with Art Mantram. Constellating Chaos, Mumbai Narratives. Joining us are author Rochelle Podkar, who will be in conversation with Yumna Hari Singh. The full bios of our speakers will be shared via the chat box, and do post your questions in the Q&A box, which is next to the chat box. Over to you, Yumna. Thank you, Raghu. Welcome to everybody. Welcome, Rochelle. Uh, Rochelle has um, quite a long and distinguished bio, comprising many prizes in almost every area of writing that she's tried her hands at. Well established now as a poet, she's also won awards for her short fiction. Um, I know she has a novel ferreted away that she wrote long ago in a drawer and she's working on a new one now and is beginning to win acclaim for her screenplays. So um, please read the bio for more information that's been posted in the chat, but I'm going to dive straight into talking about her new collection uh, of short stories, Bombay Hangovers. So Rochelle, let me start with the obvious question. Why Bombay? First and foremost, thank you, uh, Bangalore International Center. Thank you, Raghu, and thank you, Yumna, for this beautiful evening. And hello and good evening to all of you here. So why Bombay? Um, well, I have lived uh, here for many, many years, and uh, the city seeped into me uh, like cities and places do to its citizenry. And the more you, you, know, you uh, travel around its lanes, its gullies, the more you interact with it, it comes home with you in into your sleep and if because you're a writer and if you're a writer it starts seeping into your ink so bombay had there had to be one city city stories city book maybe a city screenplay it had to be there so i was i was just going to talk also now about the sensorium that you bring alive of the city you talk about it in all its shades all its colors um I wanted you to actually start with talking about one of your award-winning short stories, Parfum. That's the second story in this collection, I believe, um, where you really dissect the sense of smell. Um, I'll just, I'll read the opening paragraph and then if you want to read another excerpt, but I'm gonna bounce it back to you. Pedder Road. As a child, Rassi was affected by garlic and onion smells from his mother's kitchen, wood and floor polish from his home, chalk and ink from his classroom, his classmates' lunch boxes, his grandmother's lap, moist with sweat and urine, and his house servants' vegetable dyed clothes, hair oil, and talcum. In fact, soon smells had names and associations for him. Like a nosebleed, heady and thick like a swim through a chlorinated pool, the dankness in a cinema hall like the smell of lost innocence, Exhaust fumes from a best bus like the fear of not completing school homework or the smell of rain on the streets like a hooker's armpit he had once seen at the Kamathipura bus stop. Rochelle, I, I think I can completely see in your writing the layers of, of um, your poetry rising up to the surface through the choices that you make in the language. It's so textured. And, um, and it really is vivid in the imagery that it evokes. Um, I wanted you to talk a little bit about how you wrote um, Parfum um, and maybe through that also how you wrote, you know, about um, the mills and, you know, the research that you've done because the granularity of the detail that you bring out is so precise um, that it really brings to mind someone who's writing from inside the mind of the character. Thank you. Thank you for saying uh, saying this, Yumna. But I also want to thank you for your your engagement because a reader needs to be that engaged with the text as much as the writer is, right? And I am with the city, so you you, you know there's a level of engagement that is required to read through this. Uh, when we talk of sensorium, uh, because this city, uh, you know, you you and me were talking earlier about how what is the city like, and I felt Bombay was always. Uh, a person because it had it was everything it was growing all the time 
it was metamorphosing and i think a lot of my poetry covers that where i you know one poem significantly covers transmogrification of a city which is uh, which can only be correlated to transmogrifying of of a human being you know because it's always at at some c section not just at intersection it's all this some flyover always coming up this the city is always teeming with ants and bees not only in its people but it's it's always moving okay it's just always moving by the minute by the nano minute so uh, when you think about the senses uh, in as it seeps into you it seeps through the sight i always felt bombay was this gray city with gray seas gray roads there was too much of gray in it very little green in it and then it's the monsoonal green okay so we and this beautiful charming mons monsoons which you never find anywhere else and then it's the gray again so uh, the whether it's the sight whether it's the smells whether it's uh, even the sense of claustrophobia and space and uh, space in two three senses not just uh, because it's a con congested island city but space also because no one interferes in anyone's life so we have a lot of space in this claustrophobia <laughs> everyone lives their lives and they keep their noses right ahead of them and i really appreciate that of bombay because it's again those the teeming march of ants and bees right so always busy um then there's the the noise and uh, you search for the silence and you do find the silence in in pockets of the night or the coast or uh, those quiet places those old places so everything all these senses seep into seeped into the stories but they first seep into you so that's where i would you know say talk about sensoria so so that's uh, that's uh, one and perfume uh, or parfum um, this was a notable entry at the disquiet international uh, you know literary uh, competition uh, see i don't know from where these stories came about yumna i wrote the first one in 2005 and the last story in this was written in 2015 and it was not a conscious book project bombay hangovers it just so happened to be that i wrote a lot of stories around the city when i was trying to collate work i realized okay there's a common thread of the city running through could this be the bombay stories and then it was the bombay stories you know it's like how you discover yourself in your writing in retrospect that these were the footprints these were your footprints and this clutch of footprints could be called something so this was called bombay hangovers um, but i think the characters themselves came to you like the senses in the city they just come because there are so many characters you meet so many people and they are so vibrant uh, they're so full of story oh, their back stories and where they are going even if they don't tell you where they are going you know where they are going from where they've come right and uh, you know where you are going because you are also a co-journeyer and you never forget this transients this travel this transmogrification with the city uh, with you with the, with the citizenry and that's how these characters through to came in and i don't know when rusi came in when perfume came in sometimes you feel everything is just a convergence you will find a character then you will find uh, a, a a sense you will find a theme and they all come together and tell a tale and then you you you'll write that or you'll seek it rather because a lot of stories or storytelling is also seeking the story the truth of the story that you want to seek and it's difficult it's not always easy uh, none of these stories were very easy to write because sometimes you know as a storyteller i don't know i know only a part of the story and then you start seeking and you eventually find it so i think seeking is very much something that's at the center of most of your stories you know every character is on this uh, this journey and uh, and i loved also how you use the city as a barometer of where the characters were so for instance um in paranoia uh which is for our uh, audience who haven't read it it's it's uh, it follows three different characters on their own individual arcs paranoia and one of them is uh, nitin kandelkar who is an ad executive who starts getting really harassed by this young intern um and preeti vani is described as too elite for facebook she was on instagram uploading selfies and um and nitin Nitin's trying to sort of put into words this harassment he's feeling, which is, you know, he he wonders if this discrimination and rudeness is because he comes from a faraway place, 
or because the per square foot of his house was only 4,000 rupees and hers is 50,000 rupees. You know, is it is it that it's a mark of poverty, smallness, backwardness, rustic rurality? You know, how how do you how do you um, depict that discrimination that is really a class discrimination, but in the parlance of Bombay? Yeah. And I just wanted to bring that intersection of character and place together in um, another one, which is fabric, which is set in Baikula, mm -hmm. in the cotton mills, and. Uh, and would you like would you like to read an extract or should I um, read the paragraph that I have? Yeah, you, is, you, you could read the paragraph. This is every holiday Dhamu, who's the central character here, would sneak, no, Kai, Dhamu is the father's, would sneak Kailash into the mill. And while his father chatted with the oilers and loom cleaners, Kailash played around with the dye houses, engine houses and workshops. He watched water flowing for the scribbling, carding and spinning as his father slowly mouthed these words for him with a glow over his face. Kailash never forgot the hum of boilers and the song of engines in the weaving shed after he had heard them first. He hoped his mother would work in the mills too, so she could leave him in the mills crash with other children. On an idle Sunday, the family visited Mazgaon docks to watch raw cotton bales for the mill come in. The cotton mills, and this story really becomes central um, as in the story of cotton mills in Bombay becomes central to this character's arc that you weave. Um, and, and I wanted to talk about, you know, your inspiration for this particular story. Was it, was it something that uh, came out of your history and knowledge of Bombay that you said, okay, this was something that, you know, the closing of the cotton mills was an era defining moment for Bombay, or was it more that the, the, the character came first and then you decided to situate him uh, in this era? Yes, yes. Thanks, first and foremost, for reading that. Uh, when you know, when uh, when you have your story read by, by by another voice, the story sounds different. You know that, right? I mean, that's the silent kick we always get from reading each other's stories. Uh, so, uh, first and foremost, yes, I'll talk about the about uh, the class, uh, uh, you know, difference in in the story paranoia, uh, because. Uh, of course, when, you know, Bombay for me, because I came from the satellite town in Kalyan, okay, so Bombay was still as aspirational as it would be for the rest of India. Only it, because I didn't come from too far away, a small town, but just a small town, you know, there, like just a stone's throw away. It was still aspirational for me, though. And um, you come to the city, and then I realized that I still have aspirations. So it, you, sometimes you feel you never reach the place called Bombay. You never reach the place called the city because the city moves. It's like, a like you know, moving away and away. And you probably realize it was always the story or the journey of your aspirations. And it was never the city. And you had mixed up the two saying that when I go to Bombay, this will happen. When I go to Bombay, I'll have freedom. When I go to Bombay, magic is going to happen. And then you realize, no, no. So this is this is the castle of, of Franz Kafka's tale, which, which you do arrive into. <laughs> Okay, and you still can't find the castle. Uh, so um, that apart, uh, when I came to Bombay, so Bombay was unified, it was one territory for me, but only when you meet with people, when you live in suburbs, uh, and when you think about South Bombay and our district, and then you start realizing, okay, so this is an island city, this is con this is a congested place. Here, each little inch of space costs a lot of money. And then you would also come across people who say, you know, we live uh, beyond Thane, we live in Ambarnath, we live in Kalyan, we live uh, in the back of beyond. That's a very common phrase for people who live too far away beyond Bandrao and Dehriyo. I don't know what is the new place because Bombay itself keeps moving you know, it's uh, except it's art district, it's business districts have moved, it's shopping malls have moved, you know, it's like this heaving monster that keeps sh shifting its belly and its intestines. So at the same time, you will find people say, you know what, I live in uh, uh, Daisa or Borivli, and they will have a little bit of like, uh, not everyone will be proud about that, because you know, you're, you don't live in Bandra, you don't live in, you don't live in town, man. So I was wondering, what is this? Because where in my aspirational city that the, these divides come and I call it the geographic racism because that's what it is you know it's it's not a big thing but it's definitely there for people it does prick people who come from these suburbs and these um, and other neighborhoods which are not cool uh, and pretty and you know a well uh, well uh, 
as concrete with infrastructure so they always had to go through that little jibe and that little poke it might be done in good in, in banter but it's not for the people and i met somebody actually uh, who became a friend who told me about how much he was harassed because he he lived in ambarnath and came to work in ta in town and he said he actually had uh, a lot of uh, issues to deal with because he came from ambarnath so i said you mean to say you you had train journeys to deal with on your way and back to work standing in the crowded train and on top of that you had to bear this that you came from there i mean how much do you do you bear for something as nonsensical as space because finally home could be anywhere so this was one kind of impetus that came from somewhere uh then i think um it doesn't mean ki you know every epiphany becomes a story but it means that it definitely does collect in your psyche and you find something very interesting and i have no shame in saying that i live in daisar because i love daisar but to someone else is like oh where is daisar you know it's like it's there man it's near verily <laughs> i don't have that thing in me you know like oh my god it's like the back of beyond because the back of beyond for, like it's it's a perspective right <laughs> for us that is the back of beyond yeah <laughs> so so um this was one little epiphany and then i think few other things got about like you know how stories they tread treadle themselves you know epiphany after after epiphany until you feel okay there's something coming there there's something brewing there i think the same thing happened about the textile story um i saw a lot of malls coming up at one point in time uh, because uh, you know there was a time i interacted with bombay as an aspirational small towner which was the andheri shopper stop mall few malls and then much 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 years later there were in orbits and there was this and that and that and people lived and breathed Uh, air conditioned malls you know if if you say mall rat i, I don't give into that but it's like it's a funny little thing label uh then i started thinking about malls and reached mills then reached land and somehow or the other i think at some other point in time i was watching people like watchmen who one day i just what wondered whether these watchmen no one says i want to be a watchman when i grow up it has to be some uh, it has to be uh, an employment or a job out of need so when you start thinking about people who do these supporting jobs for you they never had aspirations to do them they probably had talents and skills that lay somewhere else they do this for their livelihood and then uh, kailas ranade came somewhere into the picture and then i started researching on mills and that's how the story you know just took shape Thank you, thank you for that. I wanted to know if you'd like to read an extract from the arithmetic press. Oh, wow! Now, Yumna, we know this is one of the most explosive stories. <laughs> we'll talk more about We're it. We're going to discuss that. We're going to come right to that after this. We are going to. Okay, so um, yeah, I would take it from. I think the page sixteen, somewhere in the middle, and I'll just read the, some few words. Narain couldn't upset the apple cart. Neither his sister's PhD, nor her mentors. Even though every time he noticed Monica, he hauled his breath beneath his quickening chest beats. He thought of intelligent women like Monica. So much smartness coupled with beauty. Had he found the female utopia? Talk to them and get a taste of their worldview. Then taste their femininity. with other senses not that he could easily execute the second stage of his thought process he was stuck on the first and probably that's why the latter felt all the more alluring and hypnotic when was he going to get her how much longer was she aware of him in that sense did his drooping eyes convey what his arrested tongue could not He sometimes assisted the two of them in their studies before he headed to the Institute of Mathematics Research, where he worked on topology. A math scientist himself, he intricately studied curves, surfaces, objects in a plane, and three-dimensional spaces. Maybe he studied them outside the institute too. He liked shapes anyway. Oh, didn't he? the properties of objects preserved through continuous deformation by twisting bending stretching 
but not tearing where a circle could be an ellipse a sphere an ellipsoid topology the study of knots at the institute he and his fellow researcher were working on topology top, topologizing broken dna strands the applications of knot theory in molecular biology had evolved just 10 years earlier in the 80s dna formed by pairs of molecular strands in a double helix could become tangled knotted or broken which made it difficult for it to carry out functions and biochemists were looking to determine how enzymes could remodel or manipulate dna topologists like narain now use the knot theory and the tangle model to deduce how broken strands could be bound this process that they referred to as site specific recombination using calculus of rational tangles and linking numbers but when he and his fellow researcher needed a coffee or smoke break they would talk about the shape that almost ruled the world the female shape desmond morris says that the round shape of a woman's breast evolved as a sexual attraction counterpart to the buttocks his friend would muse a frontal secondary sex characteristic to encourage face to face copulation in the missionary position for the upright bipedal human being but what if i still want the rear entry position narain asked and they laughed snuffing out their cigarettes and going back to work thank you rochelle um you know you start the book off with the male gaze uh sexually looking at uh the other character in the book right yeah. and um, and you don't shy away from it so you're quite explicit um i'll just i'll give our audience the the first line it says narain always had a semi hard on when monica was around so this is how the collection of short stories starts with this sentence i wanted to talk to you about um we we'll come to the broader question about sexuality in the book but i wanted to start with why did you decide on this chronology because it's it's um i think it's very bold to start like this with this choice uh, where the first page essentially objectifies a woman entirely so rochelle why absolutely you know you know this is one of the most uh, this is one of the most sharp questions <laughs> but um uh, uh you know um this uh, this story arithmetic of press was first written and self published in my earliest short story collection uh, when i couldn't find publishers okay to support short stories and i still wanted to go ahead and publish so i published it in this and this story had the maximum resonance okay from men and women alike once they read the story see that's the point you need as a reader to cross the gates of narain's lust to reach the story and many of them stop at the first line right the moment they read the first line it's like ah oh, this is erotica ah oh, this is this but is it actually the readers insecurities it is the readers um, barriers that are coming in the way of reading so i would urge all the readers don't fear read the story <laughs> don't fear it's not erotica really really but then i don't even mind if it was erotica because i don't shy away from genre i'm quite jona agnostic but this is not erotica so uh, this it had a lot of resonance with the you know both male and female readers and it had a lot of eyebrow raising because you know the word breast i mean we don't say that in india we don't really say that so um uh, that was one thing so i thought okay let for shagun i would like to start with a story that resonated in a self published book so when i was collecting this this was a bombay story eventually so i put it up first there and i was ready to take on you know this idea that people will be uncomfortable with this line opening line or they will be uncomfortable with the premise but let me tell you yumna all who have read through the story tell me something completely different like you yourself did and so many others so i i i'm waiting for that i'm just waiting for the reader to break through their own barriers as they read <laughs> okay and how did this come about if you ask me uh, i think this was my vengeful re response to uh, to all the objectification that i as a woman received or women in general receive that i know of and at 
because the world never lets you forget you're a woman so i always remember i'm a woman in the city i'm the woman in the world but i would like to sometimes forget i'm a woman and just be a person a human or an atom uh, just be nothing like a molecule in space watching uh, you know the world and not be a woman but the world wants you to remember what it wants you to remember rather than what you want to remember so there is always this battle of memory and memory uh, and battle of being so i always knew that i was a woman because even if i tried to forget it i would never be allowed to forget it say on a street a crowded bus you never allowed to forget you're a woman and uh, for good and for bad sometimes it's always also good because you know you get uh, you get indulged or praised so you, you don't mind that you get doors opened you don't mind that but you're always rem reminded so somewhere that was always there and then you know this fascination with the breasts and you you come across all the men uh, who are like you know uh, this man or that man and i was like okay you know what i'm going to take you to task this is our anatomy <laughs> and i'm going to have fun with our our anatomy from your point of view <laughs> so let's have it <laughs> you know so this was my response to all all the obsessions that uh, you know men have with women you know and women have with themselves because i also know that uh, women uh, worry about the size of their breasts uh breasts are quite an important uh, motif uh, as we grow up uh, and you know we keep growing like the city so this is uh, an important obsession about breasts you know so i was like okay let me just take this head on this is an ode to the breast <laughs> So wonderful thank you and you know i i assure readers who haven't read the book that um, it is a very rewarding story it i think it's true of all of the stories in the book for the most part that it expects the reader to meet uh, the writer halfway and if you do then then you know uh, there is gold at the end of the rainbow thank so you. um yeah. i i wanted to then you know just talk about uh, because you use sexuality as a, as a tool you know for instance where you talk about uh, the scent of a conscience which is essentially about fantasy it's about infidelity um it's about uh, your own your own sort of um your illusion to yourself of what you're seeking right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, tie that back also how how the world looks at mumbai as as a dream destination as a fantasy and what happens when morning comes you know uh, sometimes it's it it dawns nice and sunny and beautiful and sometimes it's just the the business for city going about its day so uh, at, at towards the end of scent for conscience in fact i think it's the last section again you talk about the city saying the sky had turned into swirls of ochre young people were filtering out of tall glass buildings milkmen clanging their metal cans tied to their cycles word on security guards clacking their batons on the pavement walked on rat killers and rats call center employees and call girls scampered off the bend of visibility every doubt and distress was vanishing a traffic light frozen in red green and orange greeted the traffic revving up in morning mist um i wanted to talk about about you know bombay as a dream you know and what happens when you wake up from that dream and how you how you rediscover yourself because i think so almost every story actually is 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 a character on a journey and that's a meaningful journey it's you know whether it's struggling with rape whether it is uh, you know dealing with a husband who who's died and and uh, and now you are actually free of his terrorizing presence whatever it is i think there's a strong stand of feminism through the book strong stand of sexuality but i wanted to talk about this idea in this book about um about bombay as a fantasy uh, your life as an illusion and what happens when you wake up from it what you choose to do so that that is uh, again uh, uh, such a deep question but uh, uh, so i'll i'll talk about the sexuality and the city first and then then this reawakening uh, so i think uh, you say right ki the scent, the scent of a conscience our lovers arithmetic of breasts if if you will and um, i think there are a few other characters and stories that follow sexuality because uh yeah because it's 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 so everyday it's so ordinary uh, sexuality is so it should be normal uh, so my characters besides everything else they're also very sexual beings uh, in in whichever spectrum of sexuality and expression or repression they might be in um yes and and it's very uh, yes it's nice that you say that you know that um, you found the awakening from a dream in scent of a conscience 
because yes, through um, some realization, Shonali in the story, the center of her conscience wakes up because the infidelity or the reasons for it that she wants to go after are different, you know. So her infidelity is not to do with escape alone. Her infidelity is to do with scoring over the poor married wife who's at home. Okay, so the more the poor married wife is at home, uh, she doesn't mind, you know, hooking up with this guy in her head. But the moment that poor married woman is no longer poor, but she's probably also busy or she's found something nice or entertaining to do, she's no longer poor. So the score is null. And so Shonali doesn't really have a leverage. So I also wanted to bring out, uh, you know, that easy sexuality that women have, but we are in, in a society, we're not, we're not supposed to, uh, supposed to show this. So it's the man who always goes about, but it's not the woman who goes about, but actually anyone can go about. Sex is a lot to do with uh, mind, the mind actually, and uh, uh, less to do with the heart if you want it to be that way. But it's it's a, it's this whole combination, and and women are uh, are also as likely to be, uh, you know, infidelous or disloyal as much as men are likely to be uh, very loyal and monogamous. So it's nothing like that as we have earlier kind of delineated it. Uh, the re the reawakening, you know, Yumna, when you write stories, as you would know, because you've also written so much of fiction, uh, so many of our characters are alter egos, right, of ourselves. So the more we know of ourselves, the no more we know a little bit more about this character, or that character, we can characterize. So as much of self diagnosis that goes on every day with us, uh, that's what an alter ego has, a faction of that. So I feel the reawakening that is taking place with characters in this book, you know, in many of the stories is because I feel I'm in, in this constant process of waking up and then you realize you're, in, you're still sleeping and you then want to awaken again and you want to be awake and then you're still asleep. And sometimes I wonder how many iterative loops of sleep are we in? When will we finally awake? Is it, uh, it's a very philosophical uh, seeking, of course, but is it at the point of death that you're totally awake for this life? And are you in slumber or an iterative loop of sleep? Uh, so, because every day then from where do you get these epiphanies and inspiration? Because it means that with each epiphany or inspiration, you are getting more awake. So you were asleep, minus that epiphany. So the characters also will have those reawakenings every now and then. And uh, that is the process. And, and this reawakening can be small. It could be very big, like uh, an entire life devastated, like uh, Kailas Nana days, or because it's against the backdrop of uh, history and textile mill closures. Or it could be something very tiny, like the premise of infidelity has shifted. So now you will reawaken or you will awake, awaken. So, yeah. Thank you. I, I wanted to just um, contrast actually two sections where the character runs away from mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You have um, John who one day just walks away, right? He just, he hangs his, bag on a lamppost and leaves and uh, is practically never heard from again um, and and you know he this is years and years later and when he's sleeping sometimes John would hear the city crowding in his breath his beating heart and ears those machines making soft ricocheting noises printing and xeroxing in the blur of ticks clicks telephone ringing sounds snippets of conversation all urgent and important but disjointed irrelevant the next day he turned over to his other side now in his sleep and those sounds vanished. Yeah. And, um, and then of course, Sharda, who is the, the mother of two and married and, you know, just decides one day after rescuing a girl from a, from a traffic accident to get on the motorbike with her and leave. Mm -hmm. And then it says in these three months of ups and downs, her memory flooded like a ledger of hills, forests, ravines, pagodas and prayer flags fluttering in the wild, wild wind. And I wanted to talk about, um, about city and escape, you know, how, how sometimes the city is just is your prison cell. Yeah. And, uh, and how just getting away geographically can either remake you uh, or, or leave those left behind completely desolate, devastated. In the case of Sharda, they learn how to survive without her and, and still welcome her back. Mm -hmm. So um, 
was this a conscious choice or is it just the arc that these two stories took see uh, i think uh, um, no it was written uh, very subconsciously uh, probably probably in the exploring of the same theme that i keep coming back to which is urban claustrophobia mm-hmm. and the claustrophobia has less and less to do eventually with the space around you and more and more to do with the space inside you inside your head and eventually you know it's like transmuting because you're blaming the space you're blaming the city you're looking at you know these closing walls but actually it's inside it's all inside and we know that more in the lockdown i think the lockdown was a big revelation in what is space what is freedom you know you put yourself in one box and then see how free you are you're very free if you want to be so um uh, i think um, yes sharda coming back is one one way but i just followed where the story or where the character could go and john not coming back because i was researching a lot into people who just disappear i'm still researching actually for another story into people who just one fine day vanish and you either have to uh, two ends come to it either they do return after years or they don't and they are dead or they never return and they have some completely different lives you know and you would be surprised as to what happened the whole story is about what happened between this good life and that good life and what happened what transpired so this very sudden change so i think uh, it is the characters of course trying to trying to address the claustrophobia the noise everything that's going on but after a while even islands and lighthouses no matter how silent they are they are that deafening and they are that claustrophobic so it's not about the outside actually so john was dealing with his own demon and uh, sharda was dealing with being who she's not she's not a just a housewife she is and she's not just a neighborhood woman looking after the kids although there's nothing wrong with that she's also more she's an entrepreneur and she stifled that and she needs to break break uh, the walls of that and that is not urban claustrophobia actually that's personal claustrophobia you know so maybe going on that bike ride and coming back broke those walls for her i think i could really go on for ages but yeah, i think, I think you have, you've really done you really read this yumna and i i i'm so grateful and thankful because you really read through the lines and the inner lines the inline and th- your questions wow i'm i'm so happy with you know the questions so i would actually i would like to talk about euphoria a little bit but before that you know before we open the floor to question then maybe if we have time we'll circle back around right. to a few more of your stories um you know i wanted to just share that uh, i don't know how far back we go quite a ways uh, from a writing group and i remember when you sent me chit mahal uh when you were first writing it as you know do you have any feedback and chitmahal of course went on to win the it got published in the best of asian short stories yes kitab yeah. 2018 kitab um i wanted to talk about where next for you because you started out as a short story writer and uh, and then you went on to uh, win a great deal of recognition as a poet you know uh, at iowa at the writing program they invited you back as a mentor in 2019 um and now screenplay so do you write everything concurrently or are you now a screenplay person in this era of your life <laughs> so so now i've been completely spoiled by screenplay so there was a time when so i i i do jump between art forms so when i was a short story writer i was obsessively reading and writing short stories and good bad and all those ones uh, making a lot of errors and enjoying those mistakes when i was a poet accidentally i may have detoured into poetry but then i was committed to the forms uh, reading writing workshopping doing everything you could then i moved to hypon uh, now when i have come to screenplay i mean i'm just a new screenwriter uh, just a year or two in into this uh, but uh, i've taken to the form because i think after hypon with the prose and the haiku i find this i used to find it earlier very scattered you know very center aligned but now i'm starting to enjoy the story that's behind the screenplay and it's so vast so as i was telling you the other day i'm not going to have a midlife crisis because i have so much to learn in screenplay i'm going to miss my own midlife crisis and i'm going to probably it's my retirement fund but uh, uh, yeah so i'm currently focused on understanding this art form and understanding 
the story that is not told while the story is being told in the screenplay that's the whole jhol and jhamela if i can use the mumbai word so looking forward to that the next iteration of rochelle potkar looking forward to your first hopefully, film hopefully hopefully yeah i mean let's see um, how it goes yeah. another aspect of you i just wanted to touch on was uh, was the role you play in cultural ecologies of course we work together on the glass house festival um, poetry from around the world which the bic was also Absolutely. a part of thank you bic um and you know i found it was so meaningful in the lockdown to and start with a small idea and then turn into these four full days of such rich dialogue and uh, really replenishing of the soul um so i wanted to talk to you about this uh, the importance and why you continue to spend time in these spaces that is about not just your own work but nurturing other pe people's work so first and foremost let me thank you yumna because that was your wild idea one fine evening right <laughs> so <laughs> which which finally snowballed into the festival which happened actually you know and it's going to happen this year as well and we are going to snowball it so thank you for that wild idea you you are the chupi rustam who doesn't talk about all the ideas that you you keep keep kept hidden okay in your cupboards and closets um but i think i think um uh, i became a curator again by accident because uh not for glass house for glass house i was very conscious as a curator like i was already there but i remember the first time when i started curating things uh, i think there's a time in life you know when you you write enough of your own and then you are inquisitive about other people's works and you want to bring them on the table and appreciate that and uh, uh, after that your inclusive the your instinct to include grows because you realize that you're not the only bird in the forest but it, the forest is of bird song okay and every bird is important and every music is important and i think the curatorial instinct comes from there before this whole word curatorial because you you want to start opening up the the you know table for everybody you want to hear everyone out you want to hear different languages out so you 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 don't mind uh, languages then you want to hear different time zones how people uh, uh, deal with history in say europe in america what's the history in africa uh, your own histories because we have so many histories of our own so many languages i think it's just it's just that a need uh, to explore and to learn from other people that you start opening up the table and the doors and windows and then the only way to do that in you know in poetry is through festivals through uh, maybe anthologies that you edit uh, so i think glass house was something which was uh, which we did last year had encompassed so many things right i mean it had competitions it had a magazine with or, or rather to be edited it had uh, um, readings from across the globe it had so many things so many languages of india were were on the on that play so i think this is the this is the you know a movement of inclusiveness and i think that instinct you tell me if if it isn't with you that's what i feel is with you you know to have everyone come and just let let's have it as big as ever you know everyone say something share your new a uh, new writings you know let's converse i think this is conversations you know so and i think the richer they are you know the more inspiration you find the better you understand life uh, yes. the the more you broaden your own horizons so um in fact as you said rightly one of the things i'm most proud of is the is the tender poets volume that's coming out of children's poetry yeah, that came out right. of glass house of the kids so absolutely absolutely and i'm super excited about that but um coming back because i think it's almost time for questions um let's open the floor i i already have three questions here so i shall pose them to you uh jija hari singh asks um she wonders if geographical racism is everywhere or unique to mumbai and delhi and just the big cities mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you jija and first and foremost pranam jija <laughs> so happy to have you here uh so uh thanks for this question so no 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 i think it's everywhere at at least it's there in the big cities i know it's in hyderabad it's in delhi in the metros but i think it's even in goa uh salsit and bardes and you know they'll do all those things but i think it's 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 in many places and who knows it more is the people who don't live in those you know posh localities or neighborhoods as they call it these are the people who know it the ones who live in it are like you know fish in water privileged we don't know that yeah yeah 
question from Lakshmi. She says she loves the thought. Are we awake to this life at the time of death? So more of a comment rather than a question. Thank you, Lakshmi. Thank you. We could have a conversation someday on that. I think we could have a conversation on so many things. <laughs> so I think we could just be going forever. Yes. Uh, there is another question actually from Jija where it says, how did your style evolve? You know, challenging barriers in the mind of the reader, taking sexuality head on. Uh, and then is the story about the city, you know, is it is it part of your signature style? Like you talk about O. Henry and the ironic twist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Jija. I think uh, it's... Um, mm, uh, Style, style of voice is one thing that I think evolved and it evolves very subconsciously. So even though I know that I write it in this way, but I don't know how exactly because you're very un, you, you write it very unconsciously. But the themes are something uh, definitely that keep changing. So there was a time when uh, I was very interested in, uh, in uh, sexuality and I still am because that's one question as a woman that it doesn't leave me because uh, sexuality has such double standards around it all the time. It has violence around it, but it also has desire. And I'm constantly grappling with sexual desire and sexual violence uh, with women, you know, in India, around the world. How much can you celebrate your sexuality, but with safety or in the perimeters of safety? This is a very big question. And I think this question will last a lifetime. So that theme will last a lifetime. And stories from that theme will last a lifetime. But I think other than that, there are themes which keep shifting. Like currently, I'm uh, working on a novel which is uh, around uh, multicultural. Uh, it's a multicultural theme and it's around uh, the fashion industry. And uh, uh, there's another story I'm working on, which is on identity and insurgency. So there are themes which I then kind of, you know, like migrate on towards because for some time it does interest me. But there are some sustaining, you know, mother themes, I say, which will never go. And sexuality or feminism is really one of them. Uh, I think claustrophobia will be one of them. Discrimination of all kinds will be one of them. So these don't go. And some themes, you know, they move, come, they live and they die and that way. Yeah. We, we have another question. Uh, thank you, Prithiti. It says, look forward to reading these stories, teeming with life in rich poetic language, bringing together the custodian, the everyday with larger questions of the journey, reawakenings, epiphanies, is there a tension in crafting the microcosm and extracting the metaphysical? Wow, thank you, Pratiti. And, and so nice to, to e-meet you again after last year's Glass House. Uh, uh, we never had a chance to meet. I hope we meet post-lockdown. Uh, so I think uh, to talk about the microcosm and it, you know, even before I was a writer, I noticed that I did, uh, I did sense a lot of uh, tiny details which usually are so everyday so quotidian that sometimes you want to uh, you know like hit yourself uh, hit, hit your, your knuckles and say this is too ordinary you know what's in this but sometimes I feel you know uh, I, I, I like to find the mundane and the magic quotient in the ordinary because I feel for very long I was running away from the ordinary thinking I would be a speculative writer and I would write magic realism and I would write magic and I would find magic and one fine day, I, I realized that magic is in realism. It's all around us. And only we need eyes to see it. There's magic happening all the time in the most ordinary things. Okay. And uh, whether it's a sunrise or the sunset, whether it's a child, whether it's someone who says something, whether it's a certain word they use, everything can be magical in the, in the realm of reality. And that's when I started focusing on the very everydayness and found a lot of things which were very beautiful, so hidden. And then you start curating, you know, you start curating and picking those things in your writings. It's, it's really the sacred everyday, you know, mm. to yes. Yes. highlight it in a way that gives meaning to it and imbues it. Um, I wondered if you'd like to do a, a reading, either Salad or Miss Salad, because it's the one story that's not entirely, I mean, not really set in Bombay. Mm -hmm. It speaks to your, your go and roots as well. Right. That would be my preference. But if you want to read Miss, I mean, anything, whichever you'd like. Yeah, I, I think I could read Salad. And uh, so Salad, uh, uh, you know, is of course a Goan story, but it's the characters start, they take a train from Kalyan, they take the Netravati Express. And uh, you could say that, I must say something before I read Salad, that like Isabel in Salad and Sharon, uh, the mother and the daughter protagonist, 
it's like most of the people whether it's joe parera whether it's a narain i have i have lived or come across and studied these people so you know the uh, the other day yumna when we were talking about uh, i was a, i was uh, at a tedx uh, you know interview where somebody said okay you're talking about rekindling the bookworm how many books have you read and i said i have read a bit of books but i have read people because people are bigger books you know so, so the these characters are all the books that i have read so isabel is very much a character from kalyan and uh, she's real she's very real in my mind she was my neighbor okay so but of course the story is tangent to imagination salad isabel's eyes brimmed with a memory of goa's roads vast green fields bordered with coconut trees the church of saint francis xavier but she yanked herself from her daydreams to concentrate on her chore with a e othe e othe e othe drill she picked the choices packets of bombay duck bombay tea powder suki sungti sungta royal halwa bought from bandra especially for milagri aunty tio uncle nieces delna and emily and bundled them into the folds of her cotton dresses her bags were now bursting at its seams she lifted them all to check if she could carry them without tiring soon just tomorrow she would be standing at the altar of milagri saibin at saint jerome's church then sauntering in the mapsa market for kokum sola sausages dried mango coconut vinegar feni jackfruit a bus ride later that familiar sea breeze would stab at her nostrils with its salty intoxicating smell she could dip her rheumatic feet in the morje beach waters for her first salt water bath of the year she would taste her goyas river sweet and wholesome water isabel's mouth went dry now her humid home in kalyan with its creaking ceiling fan felt unbearable whereas her sioli village house nestled in jackfruit tree foliage seemed to be waiting for her calling out to her isabel counted her savings again rubbing the notes to see that they didn't stick together she had saved enough 10000 rupees for this month long trip to her native place i'll stop here but actually just to uh, log line this story it's a, it's a it's a story that gets very tense after a while you know it starts all la 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 like my act once and then it gets it gets very tense so do read it i think the thing about that story that really works for me and why i asked for it is yeah. that uh, you know pratiti's question of the kotorian into the metaphysical yeah. you know at the end it really is sort of the metaphysical uh mother mary come to save you which for me yeah. resonated so much with goa and it's it's you know sort of religious history and uh so that was my yeah, prompt and, uh, yeah and also uh, yeah that and also the fact that the, that the you know i'm comparing uh, the the child that is sharon who's half goan half portuguese with the very fact that goa is like that right i mean its whole whole history is goan portuguese so uh, you know you have people coming back diasporic people coming back for their roots which is the second character and so one woman is is with her adopted child going to her native land from go from kalyan and the other one is coming from europe to find a house in goa and how these two are going to intersect so what is root what is fruit yeah basically so what's what's native land finally so yeah in fact talking about native land and you know how in in uh, bombay in some ways business is god you know um mm -hmm. and and the homage you, homage you pay to that in uh, in mist with this brothel then you know the the way the madam says that actually we're doing the god's business here and we have to stay with <laughs> regardless of whatever you want to do with your life um and and you know that throwaway line where you talk about how she brings up all of these girls from when they were prepubescent to adolescence into you know womanhood mm -hmm. and um and i don't know if you have it accessible but you you um you have this sentence about all of the hoods that um <laughs> that she keeps you could catch on to that <laughs> with that you know this is this is what life is about you need to you know um yeah i i'm just searching for the page number yeah i, I...
I'm just searching. Do, do you know the page number? I'm, it'll just take me a while. I, don't worry about it. I, I have another question. I have actually several more questions, so we should get oh, okay. back to that. Hang on. Okay. Um, there's Sanket Mathre who says, mm -hmm. and Sanket, we're looking forward to your bilingual collection with Rochelle that's coming out. But to your question, you are also an extremely well-traveled poet slash writer. When, when do you look at Mumbai from the lens of an international perspective? And what kind of literary texture do you discover in the Mumbai skyline? What a wow. lovely question. Yeah, what a lovely question. And only a Mumbai car can ask this, okay? Because you're, you're basically asking it for yourself also, Sanket. Yeah, but, but thank you. Thank you, Yumna, because yes, our book, uh, you know, uh, our cross-translated book of Marathi English poetry is very, very off. Uh, in It's just coming out in, I think, two months or three months uh, with Sanket. Uh, so I think when I started living in other cities, whether it is uh, Seoul or Hong Kong or, or Dubai, that's when I telescope back to look at Bombay. And I missed Bombay, but I also understood Bombay from other cities. Because uh, when you see other world cities, you understand what is there in Bombay and what is not there. And you know, now, now especially, uh, I understand Bombay from a very different lens. As a screenwriter, constantly somebody or anybody will say, Tum to Bombay mein ho na, humko to dur se aana padta hai. And I'm like, okay, I never thought about this as a Bombay poet, as a Bombay short story writer, as a novelist, but I definitely have to think of this as a screenplay writer. Because but anyway, so it's very telescopic. And I think that's what happens even with, uh, with moments in our life, you know, when you look back, it's a telescope, telescopic view of how you read your own life. So not just cities, but even our own, uh, the own events of our lives, what becomes key moments and what then becomes mundane. We are never sure of that, actually. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Padmini Atal who says she hasn't read your stories, but loves the language and the passages that you and I have read. You say that the characters in a writer's story are actually part of yourself. And you, as you write, dig deeper and deeper into yourself. Is the process of writing akin to a spiritual search for you? Thank you, Padmini. That's so beautiful. That's such a beautiful question and such a big question, actually. <laughs> So I could only, you know, like skim the surface of that question and say that, yes, very much. Because I think for me, I see for different writers, writing could be a different uh, way of living and life. For me, it has always been seeking and searching a truth. And I don't know what truth that is. Is it a mosaic of the truths that will finally become my little truth or it's life's truths? through characters, through people. It's understanding life a little bit more before you pass away because I believe a lot in transience. My poetry covers a lot of transience that way. Uh, so I think it is seeking. And uh, so there are two things going on whenever I write. One is exploring the truths in the stories and the characters because I want to find some truth uh, in them, but without manipulating them, just following the scent. Like, uh, you know, you would follow just the scent of something very strong without disturbing it and finding it finally and bringing it home. And uh, um, yeah, so I think that uh, that is what it is, you know, seeking. And the other thing is when you have the story or the idea, it's excavating it. That takes a long time. That takes a really long time. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Thanks, Rochelle. Um, there's a question from Pragya asking about um, whether the book is available on Amazon. It is, Pragya, it is available on Amazon. Uh, both yes, and yes, it is. Yeah, ebook and paperback. But I think for the last, for only for 10 days, because my publisher is also facing lockdown, there's a supply chain disconnect, but it's available on, in paperback as well. And then there's a question from Rochelle. Uh, she says it's it's been a uh, an interactive session, thank you for it. And that Rochelle, you bring out an interesting point about the alter egos of the writer um, and then actually bringing the characters of your story to the surface. Could you share an incident which you strongly related to in your book? Uh, you mean the, an alter ego, like an alter ego incident? Um, I I think Slice, the, the story Slice, which is on domestic violence, uh, was uh, my story in many ways. But it of course, it deviates. My sister's name is not Janet. 
a lot of the events did not really happen but a lot of it did happen uh, i i had a childhood of uh, mild domestic violence my parental uh, parental discord and i say mild for a reason is because when i came to bombay people spoke about the domestic violence in their lives and it was so much more that i felt uh, had i you know uh, magnified uh, my problems to such an extent without uh, and so then finally i resolved it in my head saying that no i did not magnify it my you know sadness was my sadness but sadness is in relativity to other people's sadness and so slice was written when my sadness was only mine and that's all i could see without seeing anyone else's sadness but it's not it's still a fictionalized story my sister's name is not janet and lot, uh, like i don't become a drummer at the end uh, so i did do all that masala that i felt like doing like i'm a drummer and all that is a closest story it's uh, a bit it's half autobiographical uh, other than that um, uh, i think our lovers is a, is a constantly uh, you know uh the two women the women who the woman who, who has many lovers and the woman who has just one lover i'm constantly thinking about sexuality and the choice of partners or desire how limited do you keep it how do you express it so it's it's a alter ego contemplation not really execution and uh, i think these are the closest uh, all the other jo uh, jo perera was uh, an old aunt who lived uh, you know <laughs> so she i made it it she was rosy and i made her jo perera but uh, so it's not um, me per se but it is someone i lived closely with for a while so i got to see them at close hand isabel was a neighbor so yeah you see somebody is a friend so <laughs> but i i do i do love them for that for their hum, hum, humanity so it's not uh, like i do follow them therefore i say you know i read people that's that's how my characters come about yeah rochelle uh, thank you so much i could go on i think for for a very long time you know i i would love to talk about honor you know and and the rage that exists in the brother and the sister and the sister you know the brother who i don't i always hesitate about how much to tell about the story no, don't worry don't worry they cover it on for themselves so so the brother basically again domestic violence uh, she grows up with it um the brother goes off and and uh, rapes and kills a girl in the locality and is on the evening news and you know is in jail and um and you know the 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 beauty with which you describe again her workplace and and you know the the circular unceasing motions of her job as a dhobi it's just it's stunning you know i if if you gave me an opportunity i think i would read so much more and then in the end the parting shot with you know the the foreigners taking photographs of her at the ghat mm-hmm. and how her own rage manifests about the whole thing mm-hmm. uh bracketed in the middle of the story mm-hmm. i also love euphoria where you know there's a joint meeting point and and you trace these three lives from three different classes as they follow their dreams and are successful you know transcending uh barriers of of class of of regionalism um it really is a fantastic collection of stories congratulations rosha thank you thank you so much okay so this is from shaji nair who is a fantastic poet he says did any of your stories make you weep for the child in you wow uh not weep but definitely shaji it really moved me to an emotional space where you do have a little twinkling uh, you know tear in the corner of your eye so that's weeping right <laughs> but yeah it just does get me emotional but it does that's what happens right when you 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 really excavating truth you do get into those that very unsettling place of emotions and you you're okay with it because you know how you're going to come out i mean that's you have the rope ways back <laughs> so yeah yeah thank you so much for giving me the opportunity uh, Th- to have thank you time. thank you for reading reading the book so beautifully yumna and for this evening you conceptualized this evening thank you thank you so much uh, to bic for the space you are always so gracious and and such a, a wonderful inspiration for culture to flourish in the city uh, thank you to the audience for spending time with us on a sunday evening i'm sure there were many other places you could be and i appreciate you taking the time out to spend with us thank you so very much and thank you for those questions thank you yumna for the questions thank you bic but thank you the audience because your questions were so i mean to say they were just tips of icebergs right we could go on and on unfurling and thank you art mantram <laughs>